Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, good evening. I'm Fern Rui from the Institute of Policy Studies and I will be your MC for this evening. Welcome to the last IPS Northern Lecture by Mr. Peter Ho. The Future, Governance, Unintended Consequences and the Redemption of Hope. Mr. Ho will deliver his lecture, followed by a question and answer segment, which will be moderated by Ms. Chua Mui Hong of The Straits Times. To conclude, IPS Director Janadas Devan will deliver closing remarks. Tonight's lecture will be filmed and the video will be published on the IPS YouTube page early next week. We are also streaming the lecture on Facebook Live. May I now invite Mr. Ho on stage to deliver his lecture. Uh, good evening. In June 1819, soon after the founding of modern Singapore, on behalf of the British East India Company, Sir Stamford Raffles wrote, and I quote, Our object is not territory but trade, a great commercial emporium and a fulcrum whence we may extend our influence politically as circumstances may hereafter require. Uh, Professor Mary Turnbull, who wrote The Definitive History of Singapore, explained that Raffles wanted to ensure Singapore's prosperity as a great port, to abolish slavery and injustice, to devise a way of government giving the utmost possible freedom of trade and equal rights to all, with the protection of property and person, and to make Singapore a beautiful and orderly city, the intellectual and educational centre of Southeast Asia. Given that Singapore in 1819 was truly a sleepy backwater with only about a thousand inhabitants, Raffles was a remarkably bold vision, which in the words of Turnbull, reflected the most advanced, radical, intellectual and humanitarian thinking of his day. The type of society he aspired to establish in Singapore was in many ways ahead of contemporary England or India. And he established in Singapore a free port following the principles of Adam Smith and laissez-faire at a time when Britain was still a protectionist country. While Raffles and his successors may have laid the foundation of this vision, it would be another century and a half before another figure started to loom as large in Singapore's history, Lee Kuan Yew, and who would give effect to Raffles' vision and deliver much more. Of course, the trajectory of modern Singapore did not follow a straight line. There were many twists and turns, shaped in large part by the gigantic forces outside the control of the colonial government. But in the last 50 years, it was political will, combined with pragmatic policies, effective governance, sheer grit and hard work of its people, and not a small dose of good luck, which gave Singapore the extraordinary chance to convert vision, not of Raffles, but of the founding fathers of sovereign Singapore, into reality. Since becoming independent, Singapore has taken a hard-headed approach to policy making, unburdened by ideology and driven by the stark imperative of survival. The government adopted a lean and efficient approach to public administration, involving the careful analysis of public policy issues, judicious use and adaptation of existing best practices, and strong government regulation. At the same time, it showed an exceptional willingness to eschew conventional wisdom and the politically correct, and instead to adopt pragmatic solutions and leaps of faith to deal with the wicked problems of the day. Arguably, this approach could define good government and effective policy making. But it is not a prophylaxis against the law of unintended consequences. Governments and public opinion ignore the power of this law at their peril. Because of complexity, every government will sooner or later have to face the unintended or unforeseen consequences of its decisions. This is because in a complex world, 
conditions and assumptions that underpin policies and plans change over time. And that presupposes that the assumptions were even correct in the first instance. This leads to policies and plans having effects that are unanticipated or unintended and outcomes that cannot be easily predicted. Of course, there are other reasons for unintended consequences, including sheer stupidity, blind spots, and other cognitive failures. A famous illustration of this law is the Great Sparrow Campaign, which is sometimes referred to as the Four Pests Campaign. During the Great Leap Forward, Mao Zedong launched an initiative to get rid of rats, flies, mosquitoes, and sparrows, the eponymous Four Pests. Sparrows were considered pests because they fed on grain. So Mao ordered the culling of sparrows, but nobody then seemed to have realized that sparrows not only feed on grain, but also eat locusts as an avian delicacy. By culling the sparrows, a delicate natural balance was upset, and soon there were not enough birds left to eat the locusts. As a result, locust swarms took over the countryside, devouring entire crop fields in their path resulting in starvation and contributing to the great Chinese famine. Singapore has not been immune to the law of unintended consequences. Like many other developing countries, Singapore's population growth in the early years was high. In 1965, Singapore's total fertility rate, or TFR, stood at 4.66. The birth rate was 29.5 per thousand people. The concern then was that Singapore's population, which stood at 1.8 million in 1965, would climb to an unmanageable 5 million people by the year 2000. Like many other governments around the world, Singapore's was fearful of the potential Malthusian impact of high population growth and so the government acted decisively to slow it down. The government began a campaign to encourage smaller families. In 1966, the Singapore Family Planning and Population Board was established, and the government launched the National Family Planning and Population Program with a key public message of a small family. In 1972, the government began its phenomenally successful Stop at Two campaign. Within three years, the birth rate had plunged from 23.1 to 17.7 .7 in 1975, falling even beyond the target of 18 per thousand. But the low birth rate soon turned into a cause for concern. This unintended overcorrection arose in part because the policy was implemented ahead of developments in Singapore that have seen, since been found to correlate with low birth rates, such as higher education and employment opportunities for women and rapid po poverty reduction and income growth. In effect, Singapore became a developed country in demographic terms, well before it became one in the economic sense. Social policies are particularly susceptible to the law of unintended consequences, as human behavior and societal changes are often shaped by deep, hidden, and interconnected forces that, because of complexity, might not be fully apparent for years. And this is where governments often run into the limitations of conventional policy levers. Public policies are aimed at changing overt human behavior, such as imposing fines to deter littering. But they are often unable to tackle and shape its deeper aspects. For example, the government's Productivity and Innovation Credit Scheme, or PIC, that was meant to invest, incentivize businesses to raise productivity and boost innovation, was also extensively gamed or abused, if you will, eroding the scheme's impact. Furthermore, decision-making in government is constrained by cognitive limitations which define our human nature. 
And this is because of what Nobel economist Herbert Simon called bounded rationality. The rationality of an individual is constrained by the information that he has and the finite time he has to make a decision. This challenge is accentuated in a hierarchy, including government. The decision maker at the top receives all the information and makes the decisions. But because of bottlenecks caused by bounded rationality, the decision maker is either surprised with all his cognitive synapses saturated, or he lacks sufficient bandwidth to comprehend the full scope of the problem. This means that the decision maker cannot possibly make a fully rational and optimal choice. Instead, he will very often choose a course of action that satisfies It is somewhat acceptable, but not optimal. This means that our human nature renders decision-making an imperfect process, one that even in the best of circumstances does not lead to the optimal choice, but to one that is only reasonable. Taking into account the challenges of complexity and the law of unintended consequences, it can lead to the depressing conclusion that governed policies and plans cannot always be right and certainly not for all time. But this does not mean that we should sit on our hands in the face of such problems. Instead, we should approach such matters with a huge dose of humility, prepared to shift course and to maintain an open mind. Having unintended consequences does not mean that the policy was flawed in the first instance or should not have been implemented. But it does mean that governments must be willing to change tack or even reverse course if the policy appears to be drifting off course. Running pilots and experiments would also help. The larger point here is that translations from policy intent to content and then to outcome are often not straightforward. When things go wrong, as they often do, how do we respond? Do we just look for someone to blame or do we work to solve the problem? A blame-seeking culture can be both destructive as well as unproductive. It might satisfy a human impulse to hold someone accountable, but it certainly doesn't solve the problem. The past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. This elegant and elegiac opening line in L.P. Hartley's 1953 novel, The Go-Between, is probably better remembered than the novel itself. It speaks to the essential reality of human existence that things are changing and moving forward rather than staying still. Understanding the future is hard. It has yet to unfold or come into being. The great financier J.P. Morgan once asked, was once asked what the market would do. His learned reply was, it will fluctuate. We can guess what the future may be, but we face the same challenge as when we try to understand a foreign country. We cannot help but project our implicit assumptions. In thinking about the future, too often we take up one change that we think is powerful and important and leave everything else as it is. So we end up with a view of the future that is essentially an extrapolation of today. And this is because of an inherent linearity in our causal reasoning. There's plenty of research in cognitive psychology which show that we struggle to understand non-linear relationships and tend instead to think in straight lines. We assume that there is proportionality between cause and effect. That is, big causes will have big consequences and small causes only produce small consequences. This linearity often means that planners and policy makers focus on the major forces in the social, economic, technological, political and environmental spheres. But some, some future states of the world are difficult to anticipate because they emerge out of developments 
that we may have overlooked, or because of developments that we know about, but whose interactions generate unforeseen outcomes. High-tech gurus often confidently predict the next big thing on the basis of straight-line guesses or extensions of existing trends. But history has shown us that the way future technologies will interact with one another and with the users has an emergent property and is not always predictable from previous developments. So instead, it is important to consider the world in all its dimensions, not just in politics and economics, but also society, culture, community, technology, and the marketplace. I vividly recall a meeting with Chris Anderson, the former editor-in-chief of Wired magazine. This was a few years ago. He told me that almost all the magazine's editors were liberal arts graduates, not science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, or STEM graduates. And the reason for this was that the liberal arts graduates were found to be best able to connect the dots, linking technology trends with social currents in a way that those schooled in single discrete disciplines could not. The insight I drew from this is that in order to thrive in a complex future, we, need, we will need to manifest and match that complexity in our mix of backgrounds, skills, ideas, and perspectives. One common assumption when thinking about the future is that we are who we are. But in that future, we would be changed too. Our interests, habits, and experiences and expectations would be different. There is much that changes slowly in human society. Our cultural underpinnings are some of the slowest things of all to change. But even culture changes. And the further out we go, the more that future will be a truly foreign country. During our Singapore conversation, Singaporeans discussed their hopes and concerns of the future, but they took their identity as Singaporeans mostly as a given. Reflecting on this process, Minister Heng Sui Kiat said, we realized and learned just how diverse individuals and groups are in our society, and yet how much we share and value in common as Singaporeans. Similarly, when the Urban Redevelopment Authority develops the concept plan for land use, over the next four to five decades, it assumes implicitly that our current identity as a nation state in a city, in an island, will continue. Yet, identity can and does change. Just in the past century, Singapore had gone from being a crown colony in the British Empire to Xionan To, or Light of the South, during the Japanese occupation, to being part of Malaysia, and then the Republic of Singapore after separation. And this is more than just about changing names. It is also about how people see their lives and their sense of place. Many saw themselves as sojourners in Singapore when it was a crown colony, not as citizens. But many of them and their descendants today see themselves as citizens. Singaporeans in Singapore, their home. So the answer to the seemingly innocuous question, who are we, may change in the future, opening new situations and new options. Indeed, long-lived successful companies often reinvent and redefine their identities. One might argue that this process is part of what helps them survive, that reinvention of identity builds resilience and anti-fragility, qualities I touched on in my second lecture. When Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak incorporated Apple Computer Inc. in 1977, the company only made personal computers. 30 years later, in 2007, Apple renamed itself Apple Inc. It was a subtle but important acknowledgement of the changes that Apple had undergone. By then, Apple was making more than Macs, it was also making iPods and the iPhone, and it would later go on to make the iPad and develop the App Store. 
In an op-ed published in the Straits Times in January this year, Benjamin Gusson, a law lecturer in the University of Southern Queensland, gave an example of how Singapore could redefine its identity. It could provide the infrastructure for a charter city in Australia, which would attract Singaporeans and migrants from other parts of Australia. In a charter city, the governing system is defined by its own charter document rather than by state or national laws. In Gusson's view, this would offer Singapore and Singaporeans space beyond current physical and political boundaries. The charter city would be a global city that would also boost growth in Australia. To be sure, only a few charter cities have sprung up. Paul Romer, the current World Bank chief economist who champions the idea, cites Shenzhen and Hong Kong as examples of charter cities. But even if this specific idea may not gain much traction, it raises this possibility that the idea of Singapore need not be confined to this small island. Imagine what identity would mean in a future where people live not just in the physical world, but through virtual reality or VR and augmented reality or AR, also live in alternate worlds, part real, part virtual. Now, is this science fiction? Maybe not. The propensity to spend a large part of our waking hours in a virtual world is already here. A Nielsen report last year revealed that the average American adult spends 10 and a half, 10 hours, 39 minutes staring at a screen each day. Last year, people the world over, including in Singapore, witnessed the astonishing phenomenon of pedestrians walking around blindly, <laughs> smartphone zombies, oblivious to the danger of traffic whizzing around them, totally absorbed in tracking down Pokemon in the AR game Pokemon Go. In March this year, Elon Musk, the CEO of Tesla and SpaceX, launched a brain-computer interface startup called Neuralink, which is developing what he calls a neural lace technology that would involve implanting tiny brain electrodes that may one day upload and download thoughts. He later spoke of some high bandwidth interface to the brain that helps achieve a symbiosis between human and machine intelligence. In such a world, what would identity mean? If the individual inhabits virtual worlds for much of his waking hours, connected through avatars on his smart, smart devices, or linked in future through some version of Elon Musk's neural lace technology, then where is his emotional and psychological center of gravity? In the old days, the emotional space that the individual occupied coincided exactly with the physical space that he lived in. But in future, this alignment may be disrupted by advances in digital and even neurological technologies. Do we embrace this future as a nation accepting then that the notion of national identity may change or at least become more ambiguous? Or should we repudiate it? The answer lies in our fundamental attitudes towards the future. By population and geography, Singapore is truly small. We see ourselves as price takers. Because we are a small country, we often speak as if the future was car speeding towards us. We can swerve or we can run backwards, but we cannot control the car. In my second lecture, I spoke about how Singapore in its short history has experienced change, not as an, a velocity, but as an acceleration. The world changes and affects us. We adapt or we perish. Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong captured this view in a speech at the Singapore Institute of Technology in October 2016. We know the world is changing. You cannot predict how, you cannot predict when, but you must gird ourselves for whatever might happen and adapt to new conditions as they come up. And there are good reasons for this view. Examples abound of successful organizations 
that eventually fail. Some fail to discern changes or failed to change. One example is Nokia, a classic case study of Clayton Christensen's innovator's dilemma. Nokia was the market leader when Apple introduced the iPhone in 2007. It was an early adopter and driver of 2G technology, a world leader in both supply chain management as well as global brand building. It was the first handset manufacturer to target the bottom two-thirds of the global income pyramid. Nokia was among the first to understand the importance of ease of use, of design, and of mobile phones as lifestyle products. As a result, half the smartphones around the world then were made by Nokia. But by 2010, this figure had fallen to one-third. Nokia failed to develop the software and smartphones to compete with Apple and Google. It had failed to see the mobile internet was a practical option, and it could not find a credible response to the iPhone and Android OS. It even rejected the development of a Nokia app store. It was the beginning of the end. Eventually, Nokia threw in the towel and sold its mobile phone business to Microsoft in 2013. We need to consider how we influence change, how technology impacts and de develops, how markets are created and change. And there are good reasons to focus on structural changes. History is emergent, and among the many possible paths that history could have taken, the interaction of structural factors and human agency led us down this one path. If we relaxed the constraints of Singapore as a price taker, what new options to reinvent ourselves could we consider? One view of technology is that it will advance and affect us, but as an external and often frightening force. We say that technologies such as artificial intelligence and robotics will disrupt jobs. Jobs will be automated, so we must prepare ourselves. Robots may be alienating, so we must mitigate these risks. The sentiment that technology is beyond human control and frightful finds expression in art. Victor Frankenstein creates a sentient being who kills people. In the 2004 film I, Robot, robots try to take over the world. In the 2015 film Ex Machina, the human, humanoid robot Ava outwits her creator and escapes into the world, leaving viewers to imagine the consequences. Yet, people and societies do change and shape technology. Japan is investing in robotics to shape how the field advances. And rather than build cold metallic objects to disrupt jobs and society, it wants to integrate robots into everyday life as if they were social beings. The Japanese have taken robots and made them soft and cuddly, turning objects into social beings. And perhaps not surprisingly, because in the Shinto religion, even inanimate objects can have a soul. Japan's new robot strategy of 2015 envisages a robot barrier-free society, where robots teach foreign languages, set tables, help the elderly walk and go out. Rather than develop virtual assistants, say along the lines of Apple's Siri or Amazon's Alexa, the Japanese firm Gatebox has built Azuma Hikari, and she is more virtual companion than assistant, a theme explored in the 2013 film Her. Azuma comes alive as a holograph, advises her master to take an umbrella when there are prospects of rain, and nags him to come home soon during the day. Another area where it is easy to accept things as a given is about markets. One view of markets is that businesses need to adapt. So if the demand for business class seats weakens, companies like Singapore Airlines want to diversify into budget airlines. If the demand for fossil fuel weakens amid climate change, oil majors such as Shell want to diversify into renewables. Yet, people and societies can also create and shape markets, even small societies. 
Fewer than 600,000 people live in Luxembourg. I think it's 560,000. Ten times as many people live in Singapore. Yet Luxembourg is creating a market for harnessing resources in space. In November 2016, it introduced a bill to let companies own resources such as platinum obtained from space. It has set, up, has set aside 200 million euros to support asteroid mining companies, and this has attracted two US firms, Planetary Resources and Deep Space Industries, to set up offices in Luxembourg as part of efforts to nurture this new market out of the Grand Duchy. Lest these efforts to create a market seem like a moonshot, pun in, not intended, huh? Luxembourg has experience. It founded and invested in, and I stumbled on this one, Society Europeani de Satellites, SES, in 1985, launching its own space industry. Today, SES is one of the largest satellite operators in the world. The case against technological or market determinism is not an argument for ignoring realities, our small population, our small landmass, or the region in which we live. It is an argument for striking a balance between adapting to the world and shaping it. Our smart nation efforts offer us a chance not just to adopt technology, but also to shape it to serve national priorities, an idea I described in my second lecture, and to create markets for integrating technology, governance, and what people need or want. Thomas Friedman has described our world as flat. Everything is linked and connected to everything else. Globalization and advances in transportation and communication technologies have put nations, peoples, and enterprises in touch with one another as never before. But there is another metaphor used by Richard Florida, who argues that the world is spiky, not flat. His argument is that higher value added activities are densely concentrated and clustered in hubs, what he calls the mega regions of the world. These hubs and connectors of the world have superseded nation states as natural economic units. Singapore is part of the flat world, but it is also part of a spiky world. Singapore is today a global and regional hub of many things. Since Raffles time, Singapore has been an important trading and maritime hub between East and West. Singapore is also a major connector in international aviation and a key node in the global financial system. But Singapore's position as a hub is neither unassailable nor preordained. History shows that hubs come and go. Malacca used to be the center of the spice trade in Southeast Asia. Venice was the center of the East-West trade through the Middle Ages. Rangoon, now Yangon, was the aviation hub of Southeast Asia be before 1962. Is it important that we are a hub, a peak among the valleys in a spiky world? Simply defined, hubs are the exceptionally well-linked nodes in a network. Throughout history, hubs have been the main engines of economic growth and development. Network theory provides insights to explain why hubs acquire wealth more easily than other nodes in a network. The world's economic geography is dominated by hubs which are the focal points of opportunity, growth, and innovation. Firms locate to where skills, capabilities, and mar markets cluster. Capital flows to where returns are greatest, and highly skilled talents move to where opportunities lie. And this was what happened in Venice, which I touched on in my first third lecture. As a city primarily concerned with trade and commerce, Venice was not a major producer of artistic or scientific talent. Instead, it imported talent, foreign talent, if you will, attracted to Venice's wealth and position as an intermediary between East and West. Artists and scientists flocked to the city during the Renaissance, making it a vibrant hub of culture, ideas, and scientific knowledge. Today, Singapore's approach to attracting top talent to boost the R&D sector echoes the Venetian example. Today's economic geography is also dominated by hubs. 
They are defined as places that claim significant economic activity, substantial innovative capacity, and highly skilled talent. Singapore is one of these hubs. And contrary to Tom Friedman's flat world thesis, the existence of hubs reflects the reality that both economic activity and innovation are highly concentrated and become more so as one moves up the economic ladder. Economic activity continues to cluster around highly connected hubs. And in this spiky world, the tallest peaks, the hubs will continue to flourish and grow even higher while the, in the valleys they will languish. In other words, the rich hubs at the peaks get richer while the poor in the valleys stay poor. And this is the power law. This means that in a network, there will always be a few densely connected nodes or hubs and many more nodes with only a few links. But even then, the nature of hubs will change. What will a hub look like in the future? It would be fatal to assume that the density of connections that Singapore has today and the centrality that it enjoys in today's networks, whether in air transportation, maritime or other networks, are permanent. When we think of our place in the world, we often think of physical geography. The British set up a free port in Singapore because it is located on the trade route between India and China. The epithet little red dot is today a badge of pride for Singapore and Singaporeans. Singapore is represented on maps as a red dot. Our sense of geography connects with our feeling of vulnerability and also of advantage. Yet this sense of geography is based on a particular kind of map. Modern maps relate, to one, relate one place to another in terms of longitudes, latitudes, and borders. They look at the world from a bird's eye view. But this has not been the only way of viewing one's place in the world as Benedict Anderson, the historian and political scientist, in his book on nationalism, Imagined, imagined Communities, said, ancient Thailand has two kinds of maps diagrammatic guides which help people make war or set sail using distances me measured in terms of marching and sailing times. But it also had cosmographic maps which guided people on less tangible, even spiritual journeys. And Singapore is much less adept at this kind of cartography. One could say that we represent our place in the world in maps to serve our needs. If we relaxed our constraints of physical geography and imagined new maps that transcend physical territory, what new opportunities might open up? And how can these new opportunities help us reconceptualize our map of the world? The charts in Parakana's connectography, for example, point to the growing influence of data flows in shaping our map of the world. In recent past, Singapore tried to overcome its small physical size by tapping into space abroad, such as Suchow Industrial Park, Iskandar, Malaysia, Batam, Bintam, and Karimun. It was and is a network strategy with Singapore as the hub. But new technologies will create new and different networks with their own hubs and connectors. If 3D printing or additive manufacturing successfully transitions to large-scale manufacturing, it could, for example, significantly reduce global shipping activity, negatively affecting all aspects of the port and shipping industry, including the transshipment market that Singapore's position as a global hub port is based. In one study, PricewaterhouseCooper estimates that up to 37% of the ocean container business is at risk because of 3D printing. So whether we will continue to be a hub in the networks that will emerge in future will depend not just on our capabilities, but also on our ability to seize early mover advantages and on how quickly we can create and attract new links to Singapore in the new networks that emerge. If such changes occur, we will need new maps to complement the old ones. And I would like to examine two ways in which our needs may be changing. First, we think of economic competitiveness based on nations demarcated by borders. One nation is more competitive than another 
in a particular sector. And this view made sense when nations traded goods. Whichever had a comparative advantage in making a product ought to make it to the benefit of all. The economist Richard Baldwin, however, says that the flows of know-how have grown more important in the past two or three decades as communications technology improved and enabled coordination from a distance. The worker in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam, or Cheng Chou in China may not know how to design, manufacture, and market a product, but the multinational corporation, or MNC, does. By training the worker and his manager, the MNC taps into cheaper workers and land. Consciously or unconsciously, it adds them to the global value chains. Baldwin writes, the contours of industrial competitiveness are now increasingly defined by the outlines of international production networks rather than by the boundaries of nations. And this may mean working more closely with major companies and cities that are part of the production networks, whether to develop new products and services, orchestrate these networks, or even shape where and how these networks develop. Baldwin speculates that improvements in communications will enable other flows, even those of high-touch services, such as seeing a counsellor or working with a physiotherapist across national borders. Remote medicine, where patients interact with doctors in a different location, is already practiced. Today, Rio Tinto manages its mining operations remotely. In future, digital platforms can tap into labor based abroad without even setting up a Singapore-supported industrial park. Such platforms, like Consus, already exist. Consus manages high-end independent contractors or freelancers with projects, including when the freelancer and the project client are based in different places. If cross-border supply of services increase, Singaporeans may be able to work with co-workers and clients based abroad as if they were physically present in Singapore. Singapore under the British thrived because of its status as a free port. In contrast, Jakarta, then known as Batavia, languished under the Dutch because of onerous restrictions placed on traders and the Dutch policy of controlling and taxing trade. Being well connected and plugged into dense networks confers far more advantage than efforts to monopolize production or control access to resources. The Portuguese in Malacca and later the Dutch sought to control the spice trade by collecting monopolistic rent in Malacca and by limiting access to the spice producing islands. While this generated short term profit, it backfired in the long term as merchants sought to bypass Malacca for less restrictive ports. The British, in contrast, maximized their commercial power by linking up its empire with ocean cables, the telegraph system, railways, and canals, with the Suez Canal being the most important. They created the first truly global market and controlled the sea lanes with just five keys that were said to lock up the world. Singapore, the Cape of Africa, Alexandria, which commanded access to the Suez, Gibraltar, and Dover. The basic approach is to ensure open access and maximum connectivity. Just as the Stanford Raffles made Singapore a free port in 1819, welcoming traders from any country, Singapore in 2017 could welcome data from any country, a free data port. It could allow data centers in Singapore to hold data governed by laws of another country, as if it were stored in the source country. This would anchor the data in Singapore, allowing local-based companies to harness insights from data. Such rethinking of borders will grow in importance in our increasingly digitized and data-driven world. Second, the flows of data will accelerate. It is not just the data that we generate on WeChat and Facebook. Machines will communicate more with each other. Complexity economist Brian Arthur describes machine machine communication as a huge interconnected, interconnected root system. These interactions and interdependencies take place underground, out of sight, but enable actions that we care about. 
Mobile phones communicate with GPS satellites to pinpoint our location so that Grab drivers can find us without our being aware that this communication is taking place. If the mo movement of data from one IP address to another will matter more in future, nations may need to reconsider how to plug themselves into these flows, given the possibility that countries will protect the sovereignty of data. Some countries indeed are already mandating that data about their citizens is stored locally. Others are setting rules on the transfer of data across borders. Today, Singapore manages its relations with other states through diplomacy and the conduct of foreign policy. In future, it will need to manage relations with a wider range of entities, with digital conglomerates, with cities, even with other uh, countries in the digital space. And this will not be without precedent. Denmark is reported to be creating the position of technology or digital ambassador. Some have dubbed the that some have dubbed the Silicon Valley ambassador, in order to better engage digital firms such as Apple, Google, and Facebook. It is almost as if technology was its own country, unlike the present and certainly unlike the past. Although the role is being freshed out, Danish Foreign Minister Anders Samuelsson explained the need for greater engagement by citing recent investments in Denmark by Apple and Facebook, increasing data usage and attendant issues of privacy and fake news. For Singapore, such an approach would build on our earlier efforts to partner other cities and sub-national regions to plug them into global production networks. Changes in technology, in trade routes and geopolitics can gradually diminish a city's or a country's hub position. Hub positions are not invulnerable despite the many advantages that incumbency confers. The commercial power of Venice declined after Christopher Columbus' discovery of the New World and Vasco da Gama's discovery of a sea route to the Orient. The example of Venice suggests that global hubs like Singapore need to always diversify their offerings and constantly reinvent themselves to remain relevant. From a medieval and Renaissance Venice, let us now turn to a much more modern example, Estonia. Estonia is a Baltic state of about 1.3 million people. It borders Russia, make it, making it all the more diminutive. It is aging like Singapore, and even older. 19% of the population was aged 65 years and above in 2015, higher than the 12% in Singapore. Despite its size and location and age, or perhaps because of these factors, Estonia has been turning itself into a digital society. At birth, the doctor puts the Estonian baby's details into the med medical records, and so his digital identity is born. And this digital identity now allows an Estonian to sign private contracts, access public services and databases, pay taxes, and vote. In the 2015 parliamentary election, 30% of votes were cast over the internet. By cutting trips to public offices and banks, for example, the digital society is estimated to save Estonia 2% of GDP annually. Beyond the digital society, Estonia is also recreating itself as a virtual nation. First, it is trying to back up its computers and databases so that the Estonian digital society can continue to function, even when cyber attacks or physical attacks occur. As you know, in 2007, online banking was crippled and emergency services almost disabled in a massive DDoS cyber attack on Estonia. And this took place amid a row with Russia over the relocation of a Soviet-era statue. So to build robustness, Estonia is now experimenting with digital embassies, where data is stored on servers in its embassies abroad. It is also developing ways to migrate data to commercial servers, such as those hosted by Microsoft as a backup in the event that cyber attacks take place. Second, Estonia introduced e-residency in 2014. You may be Indian, you may be South African, or even Singaporean. You may live abroad. If you become an e-resident of Estonia, you can use some of the digital services that are available today to Estonian citizens, such as setting up an Estonia-based company. 
E-residency helps Estonia generate business activities for Estonian companies from independent contractors to small companies with clients worldwide. More than 18,000 people apparently have become e-residents. Estonia hints at how nations can redefine their identities and what it means to be a nation in the digital era. Benedict Anderson, whom I cited earlier, argues that a nation is an imagined community. E-residency may one day build another Estonia, an imagined community beyond borders and time zones. Digital embassies are about ensuring the survival of a country's way of life beyond physical borders. The concept of a country has changed, says Tavi Kotka, Estonia's former chief information officer who led the e-residency initiative. Land, he says, is so yesterday. It doesn't matter whether you, where you physically live or operate. That's how the game will change. Is Kotka right? Or will geography and territory have the final say? Perhaps the question should not be cast in such binary terms. Singapore is already simultaneously a nation state and a global city. To consider Singapore also as an extraterritorialized entity, expanding the concept of our reality to enc encompass abstract bits and data flows merely reinforces the paradox that we already are. It was Singapore's great fortune to have had two remarkable visionaries in its short history of two centuries, Stanford Raffles, the founder of modern Singapore, and Lee Kuan Yew, the father of independent Singapore. The question is whether Singapore should tempt fate and leave it to luck that another great man will emerge to lead the nation to even greater glory, or whether we should create the conditions that will allow Singapore to extend its exceptionalism for as long as possible into the future. I'm, of course, inclined to the latter, not just because I believe that passivity opens us to greater turbulence and increases the likelihood of strategic shock. It is also be because I believe that action creates hope. Hope is a fuel that energizes society, but hope also needs action to make vision become reality. As Bill Willingham wrote in the Fable series, hope isn't destiny. Left passive, it is nothing more than disappointment deferred. Our founding fathers' grand vision and great hopes for Singapore were always accompanied by action. This is the difference between hope and paranoia. The latter has a crippling capacity to cause all action to be for naught, while the former propels reasonable, thought-out action with measured optimism. The central question that is posed in this evening's lecture is whether Singapore is merely a price taker or whether it has the ability to influence and alter the factors that shape the future. A thread running through all these four lectures, and this evening's in particular, is a hopeful view that even small city-states can influence, shape, and even create not just markets, but their operating environment. It is a belief in this view that hope can be redeemed for even a little red dot like Singapore. As a parting shot, let me outline two reasons for this belief. First, I do not want to trivialize Singapore's very real constraints. But these very constraints are our opportunities. Resource constraints matter more to us because we are small. We also have less room for systematic policy error in a world that is increasingly VUCA. But it is precisely our smallness that gives us agility the ability to course correct and to reiterate with more freedom and dexterity than much larger entities. We have greater ease of coordination to actualize the whole of nation approaches that I mentioned in my first lecture, since we can actually galvanize society within our small space. We have greater ease of implementation and greater ability to test, iterate, experiment and prototype because we do so within limited geographical bounds. And as a small state, we have greater ability to course correct if we happen to embark on a policy at scale that turns out to be wrong or misguided. Second, we should remember that responding to complexity, uncertainty, and accelerating change are not alien to us. It is in our very DNA as a country and rooted in our origins, both as a seaport founded by Raffles 
as well as a nation led by Lee Kuan Yew and the other founding fathers. No one expected us to survive, but we did. We defied rules, expectations, stereotypes, and existing, char existing character categorizations when we eschewed import substitution, courted MNCs, and embarked on multicultural meritocracy when most of our neighbours were mercantilist and communalist. Both Go King Sui's vision of a thriving open economy and Rajaratnam's vision of, Singap of being Singaporean by choice and by conviction were audacious, reflecting a unique brand of gung-ho political entrepreneurship. My belief in the redemption of hope should not be seen as something new to Singapore. It is within each of us, and with a little of effort, we can reclaim it. Of course, there are conditions attached. Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong alluded to one of them when he spoke of his wish for a sense of divine discontent, which I take to mean as never being satisfied, never being complacent that we have arrived. Of course, it is hard to change the identities that we are familiar with, who we are, where we are, and what is within influence. Yet changing identities is part of what it means to grow. You are not the same person you were a decade ago, and hopefully you are the better for it. The winds of change provide an opportunity for us to reinvent ourselves. We need courage and conviction, courage to change the identities with which we have grown comfortable with, to rewrite the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves, and imagination to come up with different identities. We should not feel that our success in future is derived from what we are today. If we can achieve such courage and imagination, then there is a basis for, to hope for a better future that is yet to exist. This courage and confidence to embrace changes and opportunities together as a nation rests on our sense of shared agency, values and destiny, a shared future. A key source of strength in Singapore has always been our people's trust in fair competition and just reward for efforts and achievements, compassion for the unfortunate, and restless yearning for continuous progress. This points to trust at this points on this point on trust and compassion bears emphasizing. And it has to be carefully fostered by the leadership because without it, it would not have been possible for leaders to forge consensus on far-reaching policies and tough trade-offs between different priorities, interests, and groups. From this interplay between internal hope and external forces of change, combined with vision and good governance of the future, our future will emerge. As the 13th century Persian poet and scholar Rumi memorably wrote, the garden of the world has no limits except in your mind. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. That was a very invigorating um, lecture. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being here tonight. Um, I've known, I think many of us know Peter as a deep thinker, but maybe not so many of us know that he's also a very kind person who makes time for, you know, for, for all kinds of people. I've known Peter on and off over the years as a journalist, and I always remember even as a young reporter, he was always very generous with his ideas and his time. I interviewed him for a book on the civil service um, you know, when he was uh, perm site, so he gave me a lot of inputs. And I'm most grateful to him because two years ago when the Straits Times commissioned a series of articles on, it was SG50, so of course we have to look at SG100, 50 years down the road. Uh, Peter was very generous in giving his ideas and linking me up with his contacts uh, and so on. All that is just by way of explaining why I agreed to overcome my usual reticence at public speaking to agree to be here. So now I'll just exercise my uh, prerogative as a moderator to ask uh, the, the first question. I was very much taken, Peter, by your, your idea of uh, imagined uh, communities. Uh, I also liked uh, your reference to the article on charter cities, and not just because it came out in the Straits Times and I edited it. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's, it's, it's a whole idea that, in, in, I'm just wondering, in, you know, it, it's, it's the idea that um, has come up when I talk to several people, that maybe even the whole idea of nationhood, uh, of sovereignty, is a constraint for Singapore's future. Would you, I mean, what do you think of, of that? And do you have any idea in terms of 
what kind of arrangement, what kind of confederation you know, might work for Singapore? Is sovereignty a constraint? Uh, I, I think uh, if you follow the thread of my reasoning, what Singapore is going to be in the future has to emerge out of a conversation and consensus within the society. So we make a future as we uh, think uh, we want it to be. And so whether uh, we are prepared to contemplate something like a charter city or to do things uh, like uh, Estonia creating an e-residency uh, scheme, embracing in a way uh, uh, new networks eh? uh, is something which uh, we, we have to agree and it's not something the government itself can mandate. It's not going to happen that way. It's got to be a consensus that we are at a reflection point in our history. There are huge challenges going on. There are new uh, global forces which are forcing change. And the big conversation which we need in Singapore is what we want to do in this period of great change. And if you, again, I have to uh, make, again, link this back to my three previous lectures. Uh, the point which I was trying to make is this change is irreversible. It's no point wishing that we can go back to the good old days because the good old days are gone forever. So there's a new future being uh, created and we have to decide what kind of uh, uh, <coughs> role we want to play in this future. And what I wanted to make in this final uh, lecture is that uh, there are opportunities uh, rather than seeing all the challenges as constraints. Actually, we should see this as a source of uh, opportunity. And we have uh, some advantages because we are small, we are nimble. So we can decide and we can decide to move if we want. If we had worried about constraints, I think Singapore wouldn't be where we are today, frankly. I would like to invite you to ask your questions. Can uh, walk over to the mic. Please introduce yourself and where you're from. Yes, the gentleman over there. Edmund, I believe. I, I think you better speak into the mic, uh, otherwise uh, nobody can hear you. Good evening, Mr. Ho. Thank you for your inspiring um, lecture. I'm Edmund from NTU. Um, with regards to your, what you mentioned about the law of unintended consequences, what are your thoughts in relation uh, to in, in relation to the upcoming presidential elections? The law in relation to the upcoming presidential elections. And, and, and the next question is, um, last week I was fantasizing with an old Bundy school mate. We were talking about how Singapore could possibly expand to Mars and work with Elon Musk. And so maybe one of these days in the distant future, Majula Singapura can be, can be sung in Mars. So I'm just wondering what are your thoughts about this um, fantasy? Thank well, first, first, the point I was making about the law of uh, unintended consequences, not to say that uh, the policy of presidency is going to lead to unintended consequences. <laughs> it, it might, on the other hand, it might not. Uh, so the issue is not that. The basic issue about the law of unintended consequences is that whenever we make a policy decision, and it connects to connectivity, it connects uh, complexity, it connects to uh, bounded rationality and some of the other issues I've raised is we cannot be sure that the outcomes are going to be what we had planned for. And then what happens then? Do we start blaming uh, people or do we say there's a problem here? We started off with the best of intentions but it looks as if there are certain things we missed out and therefore we need to uh, either reverse course or uh, modify the policy. That is the basic You can basic always change point. the law. And you can change the law, indeed, precisely. <laughs> uh, regarding uh, fantasies, I nothing against fantasies. It's great that we have uh, uh, 
uh, fantasies. But the point about fantasies is, which fantasies are we going to uh, translate into action? So if you want to create and raise the Singapore flag and sing Majula Singapore on Mars, right? I think you cannot because there's no atmosphere there, so the sound. <laughs> but if you if you could, then okay. If the society wants to do it, then let's 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 go ahead and see what we can do to do it. Our small size actually has never been an impediment for us to uh, to influence uh, major factors that some think are already predetermined. They aren't. Many of the things we have done have actually been sheer acts of uh, uh, political will uh, combined with uh, uh, certain uh, doggedness, if you, if you will. We, 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 do, we do have that ability in us and we've got a track record, otherwise we wouldn't be uh, where we are today. Okay, the next question. Hello, Mr. Hall. Uh, Thomas Martin from Forward Intelligence Group. Um, with the amount of technology change that uh, companies and countries experiencing worldwide, um, is it creates an incredible amount of change pressure on our social systems. Um, we reinvent our whatever social systems, our economic systems, potentially our taxation, our our financial systems. What do you think is the ability, willingness, or urgency of Singapore to innovate in that space for the benefit of Singapore itself? as well as for the world. Um, I think the question is about reforming our, so, our social security systems. Maybe you could just repeat, just give the gist of it for Peter. So it is just, it's just, it's just the question is what, what do you think Singapore can, can play, what more can Singapore can play to innovate, uh, innovative changes but primarily in the social system systems like uh, implementing universal basic income increasing the strength of the social systems to prepare this country for an increasing amount of unemployment okay. that will be probably happening across the world due to the uh, um, wave of automation. Well, I, uh, first first point is I think uh, it's very important that we are not necessarily seduced uh, by uh, global, uh, what, uh, what, what other people do or what people argue. So this idea of uh, universal uh, uh, basic wage uh, uh, is in itself uh, is an issue which needs to be discussed, but it is not necessarily uh, the solution. And we are not trying to solve the world's problems. We solve our problems. So this, this uh, I think, uh, speaks to the importance of having this whole of nation approach. You must have a conversation to dis decide what are the to, to decide what are the what are the big issues which we need to worry about? Uh, if, if it is, uh, do we need to provide uh, basic wage for everybody? Well, we can discuss that. But is that the is that the big issue? Uh, let, let's let's go back to uh, some of the themes in my uh, uh, four lectures now. The the theme is things are changing very fast, and if we don't uh, not prepared to change, uh, we'll be left behind. And, and I talk about things changing very fast. I'm not talking about velocity. I'm talking about acceleration. So we are at this uh, juncture, and it's a unique uh, juncture in history where things are accelerating. And I think uh, we need to uh, set aside uh, past practices which seem to have worked well for us, but which may not work well in the future. Now, if that means we have to contemplate uh, radically new ideas, well, we do so. And I think, uh, but this, I think, is... Uh, Acme of good leadership, how do you uh, bring the people along with you? And I think that also requires an ability to converse and talk about these issues. The, the, lecture, is, the, the lecture is being streamed uh, live on Facebook, so we have um, people watching us. Hello, uh, our online viewers. Here's a question from some, uh, one of our viewers, uh, Valerie. She's asking us, um, this question. The future of Singapore is actually quite old, considering our aging population. How will this phenomenon shape public policy? Are we ready for this future? Uh, I, I think this is a, a huge uh, issue, the issue of our demographic uh, profile. Our demographic profile is, uh, is aging, and uh, at some point we will begin to look uh, like Japan is uh, today. So the question for us 
is what kind of uh, solutions will we have to address these issues? Because there are a few issues regarding uh, 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 aging uh, population profile. One is how do you give uh, people who are older and who are going to live for much uh, longer periods? You know, today we say uh, the average uh, life expectancy is 83. In fact, I tell you, many of the people uh, here in this room who uh, are going to live to 100. It's 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 uh, it's a moving it's a moving goalpost. So people who are going to uh, age, how are you going to give them a meaningful life? how you're going to look after them, how, where's, the, where's the support, the financial support going to come from. So these are big challenges. But then you have other challenges in this kind of uh, uh, profile. Where are the young people who provide the energy to uh, energize the economy, who propel the uh, uh, country with new ideas, uh, who are prepared to uh, try new things out? You know, so, so these are, I think, very important challenges. The first society, I believe, that is confronting this in a very real way is Japan. Japan has all the challenges of an aging society, and an aging society that lives uh, very long. Although I understand that Korea is just about to uh, live longer than the Japanese. But it's the, same, it's, the same, it's the same thing. They're all living very long. How they're doing it? They know that they have to keep the economy vigorous. So they have got to get the young people out into the economy. So it means they cannot depend only on the people to look after uh, 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 the old people. So that's why I think the drive in robotics, uh, artificial intelligence is all a very uh, interesting indicator of some of the possibilities for us in the future. But I think it's something we have to uh, worry about a lot. Yes, the next question. Good evening, sir. Uh, thank you for the lecture. I realize that the lecture is, is very saturated with, with like future and, the techno and technology, not so much about politics. So my question relates to future of governance and politics. Now, uh, different governments bring along uh, different perceptions about the future. And if the political landscape in Singapore becomes a two-party pendulum with one displacing uh, the other every general election, would the civil service be able to withstand this constant fluctuation? Now, there is a lot of talk for, about the need for the civil service to be adaptive and flexible, and it's easy to say that, but it's hard and sometimes painful. I think it's a question that's worth pondering over, and perhaps you could share with us your perspectives on this. What Sorry, you forgot to say yeah, who you are in your background. Oh, my name is Leon. I'm currently serving my national service. Okay, great. Well, <laughs> I, I, I think... Uh, Again, I'm sorry to have to go back to my previous lectures which uh, touched on this uh, issue. I think uh, the nature of uh, government itself is changing and has to change uh, in the light of uh, how society is changing. Uh, what uh, seemed to have worked very well for Singapore in our first 50 years, I think has to give way to a, a, a more collaborative type form of governance. And it's not uh, so much a debate over whether it's a one-party system or two-party system or three-party system or you have one revolving door and you have always the loyal opposition. That's not the debate. The real debate is uh, what is the relationship between the government, the people sector, and the private sector. That is the critical debate because unlike in the past, especially in the people sector, they now have a voice which they didn't have before. And that voice is partly because of good education, but that voice also comes uh, from having uh, access to the social media, which now we've discovered governments cannot ignore. Like it or no, the opinions of a, a group of people will always be uh, very loud created by this, uh, uh, this uh, social media. So in a way, uh, I think the form of governance as opposed to government is going to involve a lot more collaboration between the people and the, uh, uh, and the private sector and the government. And that means, uh, in a way,
not just not just uh, consultation, but it also I think means that the uh, uh, there has to be some willingness on the part of the government, and I don't know how they're going to do it, uh, to extricate itself from uh, areas of policy and planning which they currently take a very dominant role in. Of course, I think governments will continue to be responsible for defence, and unfortunately you can't decide on defence policy. But, but I think on a lot of other things, governments can uh, leave it to the public uh, people and the private sectors to have a greater say. Thank you, sir. Other questions? Some of you may... Ah, okay, there's one. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Siang Pin, and I uh, finished my national service. <laughs> okay, uh, so regarding the lectures, uh, which mainly focus on future thinking, I was wondering how do you evaluate the performance of uh, the future, think future thinkers that you talk about, considering that it's not possible to, di to distinguish between... Uh, situations that has been avoided and what wouldn't have happened regardless. Yeah, thank you. No, the, 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 the short answer to that is the, uh, the job of a future thinker is not to predict the future. So there's no way you can assess uh, somebody who is planning for the future on the basis of whether he got his predictions, and I use that within uh, quotation marks, uh, right or wrong. It is uh, whether he is, has an ability uh, to look at all the factors and uh, say in a considered way how he thinks those factors are going to influence uh, where we are today and how these factors can be harnessed to shape the future, but not to predict the future. Yeah, I got uh, my friend. <laughs> yes, uh, a okay, question from Kishore. Sorry, uh, Kim Fat after... Okay, I, I think the, the gentleman uh, went okay. first. You want to defer to yeah, Mr. Mark? Okay, he's referring like to Mr. Kishore. Kishore. Go yeah. ahead, Kishore. Yeah, he's Thank my you. senior. Okay, my <laughs> Kishore. No, it's not working. I think there's a signal, uh, Kishore. <laughs> No, no, my phone is uh, Nokia, so it's... <laughs> iPhone, yeah. <laughs> Not working. Hello? Okay. Yep. I, I, I can see that uh, someone is trying to silence my voice. <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, my name is Kishore Mahubani, I'm the Dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. And uh, Peter, listening to your lecture was such a pleasure. I mean, you gave us an incredible tour de force in terms of covering so much in such a short space of time. But I just want to build on the last comment you made about how the government's got to give space to the, the people and the private sector and engage them more. And you're right, certainly not in defence policy, but in other areas. So the obvious uh, follow-up question, therefore, is how does Singapore create more space for alternative voices, dissident voices, you know, voices that clearly say things that are clearly outside the box, clearly outside the formulas that we've used in the past 50 years that were probably rubbish in the last 50 years but may actually work in the next 50 years. So how do we change, in a sense, the political chemistry of the society that allows the, such voices to emerge? Well, that, that's a kind of question uh, you shouldn't be posing to me, you should be posing it to the political leadership. But let, let me try to, <laughs> let me try to uh, attempt uh, to answer that question. Uh, I believe, uh, going forward, uh, the government is beginning to realise that they have no choice but to uh, open up and listen to what uh, the people are saying. I think a lot of the frictions we see today is because we have not yet got as comfortable with uh, this kind of conversation in the social side. I think we are more comfortable with having this kind of open and frank dialogue on the economic side, but not on the social side. It's very, it's very new to us. Uh, but uh, I think uh, going forward, looking at the way 
uh, trends are developing, it's very clear that uh, first the electorate is uh, far more well informed. They, uh, they do their homework, those who are serious. And if they do their homework and they can provide an alternative model, I see no reason why the government should not listen to them. I think the problem will come when the people just uh, lash out, they look for somebody to blame. Then that leads to a very antagonistic type of uh, relationship. But it means that the nature of policy making itself will have to change. How do you make decisions? Do you make decisions only uh, through the channel of uh, uh, civil servants writing uh, policy papers which then go up to cabinet, cabinet decides, if necessary goes up to parliament? Or do you have a process which starts much earlier in which you have a process of consultation, dialogue with all the different stakeholders? That's messier, takes a lot more time. You're going to get uh, some uh, left field uh, uh, views expressed some outright, uh, 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 some outright, ide some ideas which cannot, which are unimplementable. That's inevitable. But uh, should we avoid this kind of thing? My view is, in future, we cannot. So I think we have to move uh, down that road. But then the the leadership uh, also needs to have a, 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 a broader view of what decision making is. And uh, I think the people sector in particular also needs to know that this kind of approach requires them to take a responsible approach. Yes, the gentleman. Thank you for your patience. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Peter, for the four excellent lectures. Like Kim Fat here, uh, I spent 30 years in defence and now 12 years from the market. So I have this outside-in view. I want to ask you that, Although you say that we are small, and it's an advantage to us to look forward and give us hope, I can't help by looking at some of the recent issues when we have new uh, challenges. The first thing is to create new entity, rather than look at existing uh, government set up to amalgate them, to flatten them. I see more and more uh, agency. I retired in 2005 from Defence. I remember that time was about 30 over agency. And recently we won an analytic tender supporting GovTech. We were asked to support more than 100 agency. So my question is, do we need 100 agency in this small island? And then each agency, they have seven or nine layers of uh, management structure. For those that need to take advantage of innovative things, it has to be flattened, look at. Microsoft, look at uh, Apple. But somehow you leave it to the traditional way, it will be seven, eight, nine layer, even for agency that need to innovate. So I want to hear your comment on this. Thank you, sir. Well, this, this could be the subject of another S. R. Nathan uh, <laughs> uh, lecture series. But uh, I, I, I've, I've studied uh, uh, organizations for for a very long time and I think there is always a propensity uh, within any kind of bureaucracy uh, to uh, create more and more uh, arms and legs and add more and more layers you they, somehow I, I've seen that they cannot help it so it takes uh, I think a conscious effort to uh, scrub it down to what is minimally required uh, unfortunately, you know, uh, uh, there's always a justification for why you need this agency or that statutory board or that uh, ministry. And these are in and of themselves, uh, 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 you know, you could say perfectly justifiable. Question is, are they uh, serving the function that they are set out to do or whether they become bureaucratic impediments? That's very critical. And that, has to, uh, that question can only be answered by the leaders of these organizations. Do they just become, insert themselves into the uh, uh, system instead of facilitating decision making, getting better outcomes, become uh, frictions in the system and slowing everything down? Uh, so again, you have to uh, remember, you know, in Singapore, no matter how 
uh, good the government is, there's always a bell curve. There will be uh, certain things which are most critical. Make sure you have the right people in charge of those critical areas, the people who have the ability to uh, cut through the red tape, who have the ability to cut the Gordian's knot if necessary, to get things done, just to get the kind of outcome the government wants. And the rest, well, they just continue as per normal. I think this is, uh, I think, a reality of any kind of human organisation. Here's where I, my reporter's instinct comes out, so I'm going to press Peter. But do you think that there are too many agencies in Singapore, which I think is the heart, at the heart of the gentleman's uh, well, question? If, if, if what I, do you I, think, Peter? I, I was always an advocate to make sure that we have a reasonable number of agencies, but we should be very careful when we add uh, agencies uh, to this thing. And by agencies, I mean uh, things like uh, statutory uh, boards. So uh, I don't follow this in a great deal of detail today, but if you think that there are many more agencies than there were a few years ago, then it must be the case. But then the question is, are they uh, doing their job properly or are they... Okay, we get uh, it. Uh, are they uh, <laughs> okay, we get it. <laughs> I, I just wanted to move on uh, right. quickly because we have a few uh, other questions. I'm sure many of you are dying to ask very you know, good questions. Um, Facebook uh, viewer, Chan Chun Mu, uh, history tends to recycle itself in the future. Do you foresee ourselves getting involved or sandwiched again in any form of regional power competition? What principles should we adopt to survive? Well, I, I can only give you the straightforward answer. The only way we can survive in a, a world that is uh, challenging and always changing, and we have to remember we are, uh, are going to be a little red dot in a, a much uh, larger region of great diversity and not always uh, uh, peaceful, sometimes quarrelsome. And I think in this kind of uh, world, you only make your way forward if you uh, are strong, not necessarily strong in the, uh, 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 in, the in terms of size, but if you have an effective uh, defense system, that means effective deterrence, a strong uh, foreign policy and a very adept foreign policy, and uh, lastly, uh, you must be economically successful. If you are not economically successful, you can't, uh, uh, you, you can't uh, assert yourself. I think that's, uh, that's the reality. So the fact that we have been successful economically has given us the basis to uh, develop a strong defence capability, having a pragmatic as well as a very uh, agile foreign policy has also given us a strength to uh, maneuver in a very complex uh, world. I, I hope that answer satisfies Chun Mu. Here's another question from another Facebook viewer, Hannah. What do you think of the scholarship system in Singapore, which has led to many government leaders being scholars who are in danger of groupthink, as well as from being a, from being a homogeneous demographic? Is it something that needs to change and change quickly? Well, my, my belief is that it's very important uh, for uh, the government, uh, not to the people who serve in government, particularly the decision makers, not to be cut from the same boat of cloth. Uh, that's not to uh, say that the scholarship system is uh, bad. In fact, the scholarship system is a very important route in which we get talent into the government. But the question is whether we should be uh, uh, much uh, broader in reaching out to get uh, people who don't necessarily conform uh, to uh, a, a particular stereotype of what a, a good uh, civil servant should be like. And I think uh, to give some credit to the government and to the Public Service Commission in recent years, they actually have deliberately looked uh, for the person, not just because he's uh, good academically or because he comes from a particular uh, junior college, but they look at the whole person. So I think this effort to diversify uh, is there and it's, I think, taking place. Yes. Hi, I'm... Sorry. Hi, I'm Suhaimi. Mi. I'm actually an educator with MOE. Um, since we are talking about the future, 
Um, I would just like to ask about the education of the students because they are technically the future of our country. Um, so in your lecture, your insightful lecture today, you actually mentioned something about the Yale and US um, students, the kind of liberal arts programs uh, that are actually very forward looking. Would you actually encourage the students of Singapore today to actually go towards more of this kind of generalized um, degree or even not, not necessarily even a degree, more towards a generalized kind of education rather than a specialized uh, stream of thinking or even like education in that sense? Uh, well, uh, this will be a source of a lot of debate uh, in future, but I think uh, we need to develop a greater ability to, uh, for our graduates uh, from our schooling system to take an interdisciplinary view of things. That means solving our complex problems in the future uh, cannot uh, depend only on just a person being an excellent economist. He must have insights into how society works. Just like having a technical solution is not going to be good enough, you have to think about uh, what the social uh, aspects are, what the economic uh, aspects are. So this is one strength of uh, the Yale and US uh, liberal arts education, which is much more broad-based. So they look at problems not from the perspective of a single discipline, but from a more broad-based view. Interesting enough, this isn't the only one in Singapore. The other one is the Singapore University of Technology and Design. And remember what that is. That is about design. The design approach is an approach in which you solve uh, problems holistically. That means you don't uh, just bring to bear your knowledge of, uh, say, architecture, your knowledge of engineering. You look at uh, other angles. And that is the whole essence of what it takes to operate in a complex world where you have a lot of wicked problems, where there's no single factor that is necessarily uh, the determinant of that uh, problem. So you have to look at things holistically. So I would say the, the uh, uh, indicator of what the future brings, I think, is going to be seen in places like SUTD and in places like uh, Yale. Uh, and that's not to say you shouldn't study physics and all that, but you, know, <laughs> uh, you still have to have uh, that broader view. Thank you. Uh, are we doing okay for time? We are okay. Uh, question, some more questions. You can just come to the mic. I'm just wondering, um, could we have a question from one of the ladies in the audience? Maybe we haven't had any. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm going to ask the the next one. Um, are we okay for time? Just double checking. Ah, yes. There's another question over there. Uh, my name is Rama. I am a corporate training consultant. Uh, talking on the issue regarding the government, the people, and the public and the private sector. Okay, uh, people are more active, etc. More vocal. I uh, I spend if I'm at home, I spend about ten hours on the Facebook. I have about five thousand members. The maximum you can go. And most of my members are all foreigners. You see, the Malaysians are very vocal. Even in WhatsApp, they are very vocal. But here I see very docile, <laughs> very passive. It's a fear factor still working. Whenever I put up a thing, the night I cannot sleep, whether someone is going to take me away. Okay, now, so the issue is, how to get people, to give more people confidence. Just imagine today, I was watching BBC and CNN News. They were talking about Kwame, the sacking of Kwame, the FBI director. By accident only, you know, I seldom watch Channel News Asia. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, by accident, I switched on to Channel News, Channel News Asia. It was plain. There was nothing... Uh, an analytical, nothing highly, uh, you know, intellectual about the sacking. It was just plain sailing. Uh, the setting must be done by the government for people to be more vocal, for people to be given more space for to articulate. The people here are intelligent. They are not stupid, you know. Okay. But the space is not there. Thank you. Thank you. 
Well, uh, uh, first I would uh, challenge your, your view that Singaporeans are not uh, vocal. I think when they need to, they express. The, the, the question we have to ask ourselves, and this is really a question for society as a whole to ask ourselves, do we want to be a society that's always uh, uh, confrontational and every issue is an issue of confrontation, or are we much more of a society where we say there are problems we, and we try to solve the problems? I don't think it is necessarily a bad sign if our uh, people only are, uh, make noise uh, on the big issues and on other issues, they are relatively uh, quiet. Why do you want to quarrel over every issue? You'll get tired, you'll get exhausted. I get tired just following what's going on in the US. If you're in the US and you're a citizen of the US, you'll be exhausted. The first 100 days is there and they're, they are still going on and on. You know? so, so you really have to ask yourself what kind of society you want. And I would, not, uh, I would not jump to a conclusion that this society is docile. In fact, I have, a, I have, a, I have a, actually an opposite uh, view of this, but they, uh, they, choose, their, they choose the uh, battles they want to fight. And I think that is the kind of thinking society you want, rather than a society that every issue that comes up, we fight over those uh, uh, issues. But that's my two cents worth. I think that's an appropriate juncture to wrap up this uh, lecture series. It just leaves me yeah. to um, thank uh, Peter and to uh, make some summing up comments. I'm sorry, there's a, a gentleman asking. Yes, please yes, go yes. ahead. My name is Man Mohan. Um, so I spent uh, 30 years in the Singapore Armed Forces. I'm currently working in the social service sector with EWA. Um, but I think uh, the fact that two national servicemen have spoken and uh, you spoke about imagined communities and e-citizenship and so forth. Uh, the question that came to my mind and I think probably concerns Singaporeans is uh, how do you see national service evolve? You know, just now we spoke about we will live to be a hundred. For example, do you see uh, reservists being called back, you know, even <laughs> at 50 because we can't imagine that. We know that our constitution allows for women to serve, in, uh, to be conscripted if there is a requirement and I recall uh, in the past, we said there's no operational requirement. So in the next 50 years, um, this issue of rootedness and what serving the nation, especially in defence, uh, would look like. Do you have any comments to share with us on that? Okay, thanks. Yeah. So that's going to be the last I, question. I think this has to be the last question. In fact, I recall having uh, addressed this issue in one of the uh, previous lectures, but let, let me uh, uh, just uh, say very briefly that this whole business of uh, national service, uh, I think it's got uh, the obvious function, which is the defense of uh, Singapore, which is obviously vital uh, for so long as we conceive of Singapore as an independent, uh, sovereign uh, nation. And even in these imagined communities, which I talk about, the physical Singapore is still important, so you'll still need some form of SAF, you'll still need some form of uh, national uh, service. But this will always, uh, uh, there will be a perpetual tension uh, between uh, the desires of uh, having a good and effective uh, SAF through national service and other desires which include being a more of a global city, being a more international uh, hub, which will always put uh, two competing requirements uh, uh, into play. And that's not to say that there's, uh, at each period of our history, we have, to find the, we have to find the right answer. And I think right now, the right answer is we must not compromise on that thing because we are going through a very uh, difficult time. And you think about other countries which have got rid of uh, national uh, service or reduced national service. I think it's the Swedish who have, who have uh, I think, uh, uh, bringing back uh, uh, military uh, service because the strategic uh, situation has changed, so circumstances uh, change and uh, you have to make your decisions at that point in time. I'm not copying out, but I'm just describing how decisions have to be made. There are no easy answers. Thank you. Thanks for all your questions, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks, Peter. I'll just hand over to Janadas, the IPS director, who will sum up the series. Thank you. Um, it remains for me to apologise. Uh, to Peter for um, conceding to my arm, twisting him to deliver these series of lectures, and to thank him for delivering a wonderful series of uh, 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 four lectures. 
Um, he has circled obsessively about the future, uh, and I think this is very appropriate because there is hardly any country in the world that is as obsessed about the future as we are. Um, there must be a number of reasons for this. I mean, uh, we have focused constantly on a future of our own, own elaboration, in part because we don't have much of a past to constrain or, or, or deter us. Um, in part, uh, the circumstances of our birth, which began as a rupture, um, in part because we have been a very young society for a very long time. Whether this will still, we will remain as obsessed with the future as we become an aging society is a problem that he alluded to just now. Uh, but that may be a subject for another series of lectures. Um, um, uh, the, the past, they say, is another country. Um, but I think uh, Peter has succeeded in making the future at least a country that we would like to visit. Uh, so let me thank him again. Um, for having delivered a wonderful series of lectures and remind him that in his own future, there's one more task to remain. Uh, that he has to um, uh, um, edit his <laughs> lectures and produce a book <laughs> at the end of it. So we look forward to it. Thank you so much. <laughs>